Hello and welcome to an exclusive hour-long special with me, Alex Belfield, talking to one of my favourite people. Paul Merton, how are you? I'm very well, thank you very much indeed. I'm very well indeed. It's uh, nice to see you because you're always funny and I like that about you. Oh, that's good. <laughs> that's put the pressure on for this interview then, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's interesting. You're funny, but you don't like to laugh. Well, not very often, anyway. Um, I suppose, yes, when I'm doing the television thing, I, I do sort of, uh, I do laugh a lot in, in normal life. Um, but there is something to be said for sort of, if you keep a sort of straight face when you're saying something funny, you get an extra laugh because people, you look as if you don't get the joke yourself. So that just adds to the laughter, really. It's uh, it's as cynical as that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what's great about you. You seem to be so quick and quicker than everybody else. Nobody ever seems to get one over you, which is such a skill. How did you develop that? Um, I don't know. I suppose being at school, um, you know, I was I was sort of one of those kids who, when I was about eight or nine, I knew every joke going in the Beano, you know. Uh, and uh, but then when I got into my teens, I started sort of like, I suppose what we call ad libbing or improvising, and just making stuff up with people, and just I, I've been doing that all my life really. So it's sort of it's a it's a honed skill if it is a skill, and, and that's where it comes from. One of the things I love to do is coming down and see one of your shows at the Comedy Store when oh, right, you've yes. just got those nights where anything can happen. The comedy Store players, yeah, every Sunday and Wednesday. Yeah. Why do you bother putting yourself through? that i mean wouldn't it be easier just to get an act do 10 minutes and clear <laughs> off instead of having the danger of being booed off if you're not funny oh uh, well I, I, you've, got, you've always got the danger of being booed off just doing the stand-up you know but uh, the, i think the reason why i do the, the uh, comedy store players show um every week is because it's a it's a social thing the six of us do the show it's always completely different um it's i i was was a stand-up many many years ago but i, I sort of i did find it a little bit sort of it is a little bit lonely you know, and it's it, it can be, you know, and I wasn't one of those people that, that, that enjoyed listening to myself on stage for two hours. I mean, some people love it, and it's written into their DNA, but I'm not one of them, really. I, I, so I, I prefer I prefer in sharing the gig with people and then sort of sharing the after-gig stuff with people as well. So with some day up, it's not always that easy. I always think it's interesting. I, I talk to a lot of comedians because I'm so passionate about comedy. Mm. I'm more of a gag man myself. I like a mm. punchline. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about that in a minute regarding the new book of silent comedy. Mm. When you put yourself in that arena, something like Jonglers or the Comedy Store, yeah. you've got to be insane to want to do that because they can turn on you and they do. Mm. And that presumably mm. is the worst feeling in the world. Yes, it is. It's pretty bad um, because, you, you you know, you've set yourself up as somebody who's trying to be funny uh, and, and the audience aren't enjoying it. I, 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 hopefully now I don't often play to many drunk that's the problem you see we go to a late night club Saturday night Friday night sort of thing midnight show or whatever then people are going to be a little bit uh, the worse for wear and uh, trying to sort of deal with a drunk heckler is not easy because they're, they're so drunk they can't they don't even understand that you're putting them down you know so <laughs> it could be funny to a point but it can also be distracting for the audience and I've also seen that happen where the audience turn on the audience and that's even worse than them turning on the comic yes exactly <laughs> yes yes exactly I, I, I did a gig about 20 years ago at a, a club in Brixton and and um, there was two guys in the front that were sort of just heckling every act, and, and every act had a really hard time. So what I did was I took the audience out of the pub, out into the car park where there was a light, and there was about sort of 40 people who gathered around me, and I did my act then out there. <laughs> so I couldn't get rid of the, the, the heckler, so we, I moved the venue. <laughs> I suppose that's one way out of it, isn't it? Exactly. We're going to talk about your life and career. We're going to talk about the new book on silent comedy as well mm. and the TV series that went with it. I'm so fascinated by you because you're a very private man, and I don't blame you. You let your work speak for itself. Self. Yes. Are you happy on the other side of the desk, or would you rather be sat in a TV studio where you're just being funny? Um, no, I, I, I'm. Um I'm not sure I understand the question, really. What, 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 are you, what are you Well, a lot of you? comedians don't like being funny when you ask them to ad lib. Oh, right, Or yes, a lot yes. of comedians don't like talking about themselves because they're a character. Mm -hmm. I remember my disappointment the first time I interviewed Julian Clary. He seemed yes. so sad um, <laughs> and, and, and so unfunny. The, the second time I interviewed him, he was slightly better. But there's something kind of <laughs> tragic about comedians. You seem to be laughing a lot. That, that's a relief. Um, I th well, I don't know. There is, there is a sort of... It's a bit of a myth that... Um, I mean, Julian just might have been having a headache or something. Might have been having a bad day. Um, um, but uh, I think it's a bit of a myth that comedians are necessarily depressive sort of people. Um, you get certain types of people who are, you know, who would be depressive plumbers if they were plumbers. Um, it seems an, it's an interesting sort of uh, idea because the notion that the funny person is actually crying inside appeals to our sort of sense of opposites. But uh, most comedians I know are actually sort of um, no more bonkers than anybody else. 
I think it's harder for the newer comedians to do interviews mm. like this. If you interview somebody like Ken Don, he can go, yes. ha 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 ha, and yes. suddenly he's into the act, and it's the act, and you get that yes. for the interview. Yeah. I mean, you are you, really. I don't see you as an act, because no, that's good. you come across <laughs> as a real person, yes. which is different, isn't it, from the old style? I suppose so, yes. I mean, you, you, but you, you had to be a sort of like, you know, Ken Dodd, a you know, wonderful comic, larger than life, and when he started off in the 50s in the musical, um, you know, playing big sort of theatres that weren't very full of people, you had to be sort of quite large and, and, and to get your comedy across, I think. Um, I can still remember with, with um, great affection jokes that he did on the radio about sort of 40 years ago that made me laugh, you know, a uh, man walks into a shop and somebody says to him, you're a bit toffee-nosed, aren't you? He says, I can't help it, it's toffee on the end of my nose. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that, when I was about 11 when I heard that, and uh, so it's funny how sort of jokes, sometimes, sometimes jokes just stick with you. He was the first comedian I ever saw that made me want to be interested in comedy. Mm. I found him so curious, and I still, to this day, whenever I mm. meet him or go and see his show, I'm fascinated by his ability. Mm. He's really of that old school that he loves it and lives for it, which is yes. tremendous. Yes, absolutely. I mean, he, he's uh, you know he's a, he's a working comic. He he wants to keep on working, and uh, you know if you are a comedian, it does make sense to keep sort of working live. That's partly one of the reasons why I do the comedy store, just to keep sort of match fit for for when you're doing television programs. What about the fact that comedy kind of comes and goes, certain styles come and go? Mm. He's managed to last. Yes. I feel some of the comedians today, Russell Brand, who I'm about to do an hour special with, mm. I wonder whether he will still be around in five years, able to get away with that free thinking, isn't it? That's his yes. style. Yes, yes. Well, he seems to be sort of very, very on top of what he's doing, so I, I should think he probably would be around in five years' time. I don't know. It's, 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 I, 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 I don't know how sort of... Uh, I mean, Russell's managed to do it in the last couple of years. How you go these days from being sort of like a fairly anonymous comic to being a well-known one, because there's just so many people doing it. Every year when I go to Edinburgh with the impro show that we do, there's a whole you see a whole bunch of posters up on the wall in the venue. And they're completely new people I've never heard of. And last year, there was a whole bunch of completely new people that I hadn't heard of then either. And before that, so it's just, there's hundreds of people doing it. So how you ever sort of get spotted or, or stand out from the crowd, I, I don't know how you do it, I suppose. I'd have no idea, actually. I just don't know. I mean, when I started off doing the... I was very lucky when I started off doing stand-up comedy because the, the only venue going was the comedy store. Um, so uh, when that closed down, it closed down for about 18 months, and that's when all these other places like Jonglers and the King's Head and Crouch End opened up as comedy clubs to service that sort of... to serve that audience. was no longer... <coughs> pardon me. There was no longer going to the comedy store. So when I started, I was able to phone up Jonglers and say, well, I've done the comedy store, then I could phone up somewhere else and say, I've played Jonglers. So it was very easy to get bookings, and there weren't many comics around. Often I would be on a bill with maybe a, uh, a poet, uh, a juggler, a mime artist, uh, a, a guitarist, and that was, I'd be the only comic on the bill. I mean, those days only lasted about sort of four or five months, I think. But it was a very good time to be doing it. But now, I mean, you know, somebody was telling me the other day, you have to sort of, you know, some of the big venues, you go to do an open spot, and six months later, you come back and do another one, if you were any good six months beforehand. And so... How you build a career doing that, I don't know. It's also fascinating when you read people's autobiographies like mm. Graham Norton, who admits that he doesn't write jokes, he's yes. an actor, and yes. he's given jokes. And Ricky Gervais, I think, is the same. He's not a stand-up comedian, he's no, never tried to be, although he's selling out arenas now being a stand-up. Yes. yes. So is he acting being a stand-up, then? Well, I haven't seen his stuff, so I, I imagine so, yes. I mean, it does. It, it's, um, stand-up's one of those things, there's much more to it than, than appears obvious from the surface of it, you know. It's not just a question of standing up and, and, and saying jokes. Um, I don't know, if, if if people have spent a lot of money to uh, go and see Ricky, I, I imagine they've invested a lot of, you know, they've invested the money and, and they've sort of invested some of their emotion into it. So they want it to be a good gig, so they want to have a good time. So, uh, I don't know, you know, if they see him they're doing stand-up and uh, they're happy with that, then uh, then the world is a happier place. <laughs> it does seem to me, Paul, that if you're well-known, it is easier to get the laughs, providing you've got some decent material, than if you're mm. unknown, because they're kind of in on your act and your style and who you are, therefore will laugh quicker. Yes, yeah, I think that's true, to a certain extent, because, you, you know, when you used to, when I used to go on the, uh, you know, do the stand-up, you try and make an impression very early on, you try to, so, you know, first ten seconds would have the best joke I had. And that sort of settles the audience down. They think, oh, OK, this, that was funny, so maybe this guy's going to be all right. Um, now, I suppose, I wouldn't have to do that if I was to do stand-up. But you've still got to, you've still got to deliver. You've still got to have the gags, I suppose. But, yeah, it, it's got to be a lot easier once people have come specifically to see you. Presumably those first ten seconds are very important if you're doing something like Jonglers or the comedy stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, you sort of... I used to go out... My first gag used to be um, during... Um, I know, I used to start off by saying, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a topical comedian. During the Blitz in the Second World War... <laughs> My dad used to say, don't worry about the bombs. The only bomb you've got to worry about is the one that's got your name written on it. That scared the next-door neighbours, Mr and Mrs Doodlebug. So that was my first joke. 
Um, that sort of because that, I mean, that usually went over quite well because doodlebug such an unexpected word to hear in a, in a punchline. We're back on your favourite local radio station. It's Alex Belfield talking to Paul Merton, the star of I've Got News for You, the comedy store, and the brand new book Silent Comedy. You're going to have to really help me with this, Paul, mm. because I love comedy, but I don't get silent comedy. Ah, uh, you, yes. Well, I, I think you've probably only ever seen it on television um, because it's um, as good as it, as it can be on television. It's so much better in the live experience. Uh, I first saw. Uh, a Buster Keaton film called The General when I was 13 years old and uh, it was had a live accompaniment a big screen a big audience and it's transformed it, it is um, it's very difficult to describe unless you've seen it and what we've done in Bristol the last three years at the Bristol Silence uh, uh, show that we do um, the first year we had 600 people the next year we had 1,000 and last year we had 1,500 so it's leapt so once people come to see it once they, they're converted but it's sort of, if you see it on television often you've sort of got a poor organ score some terrible organ music or the print's wrong or it's shown at the wrong speed or, or it's missing bits or the print is too dark and, and so many different things can go wrong you know Channel 4 used to show some Buster Keaton films and some of the, uh, the, the music was just appalling I didn't bother watching them myself um, it can make such a difference uh, uh, I'm doing a tour, um, not not uh, tied to the book, but uh, we are showing. We're going on a, a tour where we're showing some silent films um, around the country. One of them is uh, we're going to show the full feature length Harold Lloyd film Safety Last, which is the one where he's climbing up the side of a building and ends up hanging on the end of a clock. Now, when you see that film with an audience, the last 25 minutes of the film is him starting his climb up the up the side of this building, and audiences get so involved in it. And uh, when we showed it at Bristol a couple of years back, a woman in front of me suddenly leapt up halfway through this building climbing sequence and shouts out stop it stop it I can't stand it and it, the, the build up attention and the laughter is 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 extraordinary and you it's a, it's an experience it's not like a normal cinema experience the the um, the difference between watching a silent film in its proper environment, a silent comedy's proper environment, and watching it on television is uh, like the difference between hearing music on beautiful speakers or listening to it under six feet underwater. You know, it's a completely different thing. Um, so you should come along and have a look. Well, the, the clock sketch that you talk about yeah. did make me laugh. It's the Laurel and Hardy stuff I don't get. I've watched a few of your programmes mm. on BBC Three, and it's been fascinating to see you describe mm. your take on everything. Yeah. Could it work today? Silent comedy is, is uh, an unfortunate term in some respects. I prefer visual comedy in many ways. But um, I don't know. You, I mean, there are people, there, there's still silent visual comedy still exists in comedy today. Bits of, I mean, The Office was full of uh, looks to camera uh, and stuff. Um, so, it's, it hasn't died out. It's just it's it's been absorbed within the the, the mainstream of what comedy is. But I'm, see, I see. I much prefer the visual joke to the to, to the verbal joke. Um, a verbal joke is difficult to remember after you've seen an act. You know, you may remember. You know, you may sort of think I remember laughing a lot, but I can't exactly remember what they were saying. But if you see a verbal thing, like in one foot in the grave, when Victor Meldrew reaches down to pick up the phone, and it's a small sausage dog. <laughs> that image is just hilarious. Um, so, so I, I, I love the uh, I, I love the well constructed, uh, surprising visual gag. It sort of it has a I think it has more of an impact on us than a written one. You're right as well. The office and Curb Your Enthusiasm have really worked on that mm. because there's no canned laughter to kind of fill mm. the gaps. Mm. They let you get the joke yourself. Yes, yes. Which is, is which is also sort of uh, what is uh, refreshing about silent comedy is that uh, when you when you're seeing a good film in, in you know with the right print and all that right sort of quality print at the right speed and all that sort of stuff, um, the laughter can just build and build and build because there's no dialogue to get in the way. So you can actually build up uh, a tremendous atmosphere. So what's your favourite form of comedy? Is this it, then, the subtleties of silent comedy? Um, no, I have no favourite. Um, you know, there's all different kinds of comedy, you know, Jewish humour, uh, Irish humour, um, you know, the the the, uh, the the stuff of Charlie Chaplin or, or, or Groucho Marx, you know, it, it's or Monty Python or Tony Hancock, or, you know, it's just, there's such a... Why, I mean, I just like good stuff. I like stuff that, that you know, that, 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 that entertains me. It's interesting, like the Jewish humour, when you look at Mel Brooks and, yeah. and Jackie Mason, people yeah. like that. It's acerbic, and even Joan Rivers. It's almost as if people like Paul O'Grady have almost encapsulated that, although they're not even Jewish. Yes. It's that same kind of... Well, you've got this, this, yes, there is that sort of, like, there's sort of a, a, that attack behind it, the, behind the delivery as well. Uh, well, Paul's very funny, you know. It's, uh, uh, he, he is spontaneously uh, funny in, in an awe-inspiring way. 
The new book is called Silent Comedy. It's in your stores now. It's uh, written and illustrated uh, brilliantly. It's a really fascinating read. It's oh, one good. for the dads for Christmas, definitely, isn't yes. it? Yes, well, I hope so. I mean, also, I hope it sort of, um, in some way, points people towards the films. Mm. So, um, there's, I mean, there's some stuff in there which only appeals to about three or four people in the world, I think. <laughs> it's so detailed. <laughs> um, but I try to make it sort of, like, accessible to the general reader who may have heard of these people, but... Um, and heard that they used to be sort of enormously popular, but but don't know why. Because you can look at Chaplin now. People are here that he's he was once the f- considered the funniest man in the world. But often you look at particularly the very early films, and you just, you can't see any evidence of that. If somebody says the Beatles were the greatest band in the world, it's easy to demonstrate because you can just play the music and, and you know and the best of it hasn't dated. And, and neither has with these films. But they, as I say, they need to be they need to be seen as cinema rather than television. I think. Let's go back to your childhood. When did mm. you first become interested in humour, and when? did you first laugh can you remember the first joke that made you howl with laughter yes <laughs> that's well, sad uh, isn't it <laughs> no it's quite a good joke uh, well I, I can't remember the very first joke but I remember this, this is one of the first I remember there's two flies playing football in a saucer do you know this joke two no. flies playing football in a saucer and one saying the other says why do we keep practicing the other one says well we're in the cup next week now that <laughs> <laughs> when I was uh, when I was uh, I suppose I was about seven or eight I, that was hilarious that was hilarious for me and I used to be that kind of person that uh, that kind of kid that you know what's 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 white and yellow and travels at 120 miles an hour train driver's egg sandwich and, and just <laughs> things like that jokes from the beano which you know just old corny things like that which i would uh, I, I i would trot out and i would have a, a memory an incredible memory more so than anything i ever learned at school i'd have a memory for these these gags i think probably my favorite comedian was bob monkhouse who was mm. i know he's referred to as a comedian's comedian but his ability to just pull a joke from nowhere and yes. have that almost rolodex in his mind of, of abc of jokes yes absolutely incredible he, he was astonishing at that and I think he be, he was somebody who became a better comedian as he got older mm. funnily enough because uh, some of his earlier stuff in the 70s and 50s is a bit cheesy uh, if you look back on it but uh, as he got up, he sort of developed a sort of rougher edge to him or a harder edge to him and it really suited him I love that box set they brought out recently of this stuff at the lakeside which was far more crude than you would anticipate it's not Jim Davidson crude but it, uh-huh. it's still quite crude yes yeah well I it's uh, you know it's, it's you, you tailor the, you know, he was a great expert at tailoring the material to the audience Thing. What about the type of jokes that you just mentioned and the jokes like, you know, I went into the pub, I said, can I have some food? And she said, uh, we only got scampi. I said, oh, I love all the Disney films. Those <laughs> silly old fashioned jokes. Is there anybody able to get away with those today and they still be cool? Um, I don't know. Um, I suppose Peter Kay slips some in, but he's doing them for irony, isn't he? I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not that overly familiar with what he does. I, don't, I really don't see a lot of contemporary stuff. Um, Are you not interested by the new comic? Um, you know, I, when I was sort of, before I got into television, I would, I was an avid follower of comedy, you know, if there was a new series started on ITV or whatever, new comedy series, even if the first episode was rubbish, I'd, I'd watch the second one just to give it a chance, I'd be aware of everything, you know, but since I started appearing on television and doing it myself, it, it lost all, completely lost all fascination for me, it's all, I suppose it's the busman's holiday thing or something, but it just sort of... I, you know, I, I, I watch documentaries or Strictly Come Dance is my favourite show at the moment. So I don't think they're you know, watching Bruce work. I, 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 you, know, you know what I love, yeah. You know, it's great fun. Men shouldn't like watching programmes oh, like you, that. Well, if you watch Strictly Come Dance and what some of the women are wearing is, is, is uh, designed to, to hook the male viewer. I saw Letitia Dean on a programme the other day. It was verging on pornographic. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> Who'd have thought she'd got legs like that? Yeah, so I'm not, I don't, she's not one of my favourites, I think, in this particular competition. Oh, really? Yeah. All right, OK. We're not going to go down the Strictly route, although we'll be here for hours yeah so comedy today then isn't of great interest to you so what do you like watching is there anything that you do kind of fascinate yourself with or are you just looking at the old stuff through the silent comedy um, and things like that I, I have got into sort of you know since the advent of the dvd I, i've really got into movies i mean it's the the dvds really helped the silent film genre in a, in a way which nobody could have predicted because you can release these films with a new musical soundtrack in stereo and stuff and actually you know and digitally enhance them the pictures and stuff what do i watch um I don't watch a lot of telly. It would tend to be documentaries, perhaps, and the news, uh, just because of having got news views and having some idea what's going on. Um, football, sports, you know. But even then, I'm not avid. You know, when England were playing the other day, I sort of I, I watched half of it and then went out. <laughs> so it's not. It's funny. The more, perhaps, it even it, it, going back to what I was talking about comedy, the more I do television, perhaps the less I watch it as well. Mm. What about this comedy thing? Then, as a child, we, we've got your first joke. Mm. Were you known as a funny child? Uh, <laughs> to the social services, I was. Um, <laughs> I, um, 
A funny child. I suppose, yes, I think so. I was one of those boys that used to make jokes at the back of the class rather than confront the teacher. So I'd sort of jokes amongst the sort of pupils at the back. I didn't have the nerve to to uh, uh, take authority on at that point. Um, yes, I was. I, I think in my teens, uh, I was somebody that was uh, practising being funny. And, and uh, my Irish cousin, Peter, uh, people have asked him over the years because I, I knew him quite well in my teens. And he said I was like that then. So, yeah, I, I suppose, it, going back to what I was saying, I suppose it's just developing a, a skill by, by constantly doing it. You didn't start in comedy, though. You, you had a proper job before you went to comedy. Yes, well, this was... I mean, the the, the, the major thing w- uh, which happened was, of course, the opening of the comedy store, because when I wanted to... You know, when I left school at about 1976... To um, to be a comedian those days, your, uh, which I was, wanted to be, the, your career options were either become a, a Butlin's red coat or a holiday camp, you know, entertainer person, or go to work in working men's clubs in the north. But I was sort of like you know a shy young boy from just outside London. I wouldn't, I can't go live in Leeds. What are you talking about? <laughs> and I wouldn't have been any good. Uh, and uh, so there was that, and possibly even fringe theatre were the only other options. So the comedy store uh, is directly responsible, really. For for, for uh, my career and many other people because for the first time you could go somewhere complete democracy it didn't matter w- w- whether you'd done it before or who you knew or whether you were a member of equity and all this sort of stuff you just got up on stage if it worked you got another gig if it didn't you tried again the following week so that was that's what really opened up the possibilities because because at the time in the 70s i was a comedian i, I was a, i was a, a person wanting to be a comedian but having no way of actually fulfilling that ambition at that time it seemed to be as as daft a thing to want to be as an astronaut you know <laughs> so the comedy store opened up that whole business you know it was like being an astronaut before anybody thought of going to the moon <laughs> <laughs> so we know what we want to be and how difficult was it to get there presumably you're either born with a funny bone or you're not yeah maybe maybe there is I mean I wouldn't like this I don't know if it's just something you're born with really I think it's just practice I think it's aptitude and you you know when you start off on stage you're not particularly good um, I didn't know what I was doing the thing that sort of worked for me was I'd written this uh, sketch about a policeman uh, take given been given hallucinogenic drugs against his you know you know he doesn't know he's been handed these things so that was the first thing that got me going but as a performer I was fairly dreadful Dreadful. But the, the the great thing about this sketch was it was it was a funny sketch and it worked. But also I could write it down, so I could read it out. So I didn't even have to worry about forgetting <laughs> it. You know, <laughs> you know, suddenly you're on stage going, oh, oh, hang on. And so it was as performance proof as I could make it. So um, and that worked. You know, second times at the comedy store it worked really well. But I I didn't really know what I was doing. And I had a, the next eighteen months with some fairly rough old gigs. I couldn't live up to the beginning. It's a real skill to remember joke after joke, especially when you're going in different places, isn't it? I suppose so. Yes. Um, um, I, I sort of, I, I used to sort of when I was doing the twenty minutes because I never, I, I, that's all I was ever doing back in the old days. Um, I had me beginning sorted out because as I was saying before, a good strong beginning is very important and a good strong ending as well. Uh, you don't want to finish on da 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 and then nothing. Um, but the bit in the middle was always a bit fluid and it was never quite, it would come in different orders but as long as I had my beginning and my end sorted out the bit in the middle was, would kind of take care of itself. Um, but uh, yeah, you'd have little bits of paper when you tried a new bit of material. That was one thing. Whenever I tried a new bit of material the first time, it never worked. Ever. <laughs> and sometimes you'd have to think, well, what if, where have I gone wrong then? Sometimes it would be, I hadn't given the audience enough information or I'd made a leap that didn't make sense and, you know, I had to go back and sort of explain the joke a bit more but most times the first time I ever did it nothing we're back on your favourite local radio station talking to Paul Merton today about his life and career we're going to end by talking about Have I Got News For You which is where Mm. most people know you from and what I enjoy watching religiously it's one of the few programmes that doesn't seem to care it's not particularly politically correct and you Mm. seem to be able to get away with stuff that other programmes don't presumably you've got very good lawyers yes I mean there was something last week uh, uh, which I made a reference to Anton Deck which got a laugh I didn't expect it to stay in but they obviously took a view, well, they're not going to sue, so, you know. Do you come up with ideas and put them to the producers? How does it work in terms of content? Um, the content is, I mean, the last show that went out, um, there was a lot of good stuff that wasn't used um, because it's, uh, you know, you're overrunning, you record about an hour and a quarter, hour and 20 minutes. Um, lots of good stuff I, I had wasn't used, but there was Ed Byrne was on the show, he had a lot of good stuff that wasn't used either. So it was, a, you know, you sometimes think, oh, that was a slightly better recorded than that, but... But uh, does that not break your heart, though, when you know you've had a corker and then some editor takes it out? Well, it's always, I, I, you know, it's, I, I always understand why it happens. I mean, sometimes the, in the past, 
I don't do it now, but I used to do this thing. If the program, if the show was going through a, a fairly dull stage, I'd try and get something going, and it would be funny or whatever. But the trouble is, they said we can't use that bit because we have to show the boring bit beforehand. Otherwise, it just comes out of nowhere. So I've mm-hmm. learned to stop doing that. <laughs> just try and be funny when I know it's going to be used. How difficult is it to do the show now? Angus was great at it, and now it's a completely different style because you get a new host every week. Mm. For me, it sometimes works and it sometimes doesn't work. Yeah. And you're kind of sat there opposite Ian, having to take the flack and the brunt of whether it works or not mm. does that not compromise you a bit that it's not the same show that you did originally oh, well I, I, personally I'm having much more fun um, a different person every week is automatically a fresh ingredient um, if they're not you know now people have come back and done it sort of half a dozen times and so they're getting better at it but if the person in the middle isn't so good um, then you have to find ways around that and, and ways to make it work and the person in the middle is only one element of the sort of five or six elements that make up the show um, I personally I, I, it's, I'm, much, I'm much happier with it it's interesting because when you get somebody like Boris on or the, or the Bruce episode, which was just <laughs> yes. legendary, yes. They, they stick out. I mean, yeah. like last week, it didn't stick out, but it mm. was a brilliantly presented program. Yes, yes. You can't have a, you, you know you, you you can't have a sort of someone like Bruce or Boris every week hosting it because they, those people aren't out there. But uh, uh, I think Bruce is thinking of coming back for the next series because he's been doing the Strictly Come Dances since he last came on, and I, I've been pushing for us to have a dancing element in the show. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're such a big fan of the show as well. I mean. Absolutely. <laughs> (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) There's a question I've wanted to ask you Mm. for years and years and years, and you don't have to answer it. When Angus went, I got the feeling that you really weren't that fond of him. You exposed the T-shirt, and you kind of threw him under the bus with the front page on your T-shirt. I pulled him out from under the wheels of the bus. Do you feel that? Yeah, because by turning the thing into a joke and everybody laughing at it, we move the sting from it, and we can carry on. It was a difficult situation because when you're mocking the news, when you then become the news, that puts you in a difficult position, doesn't well, it? Uh, when Christine Hamilton starts scoring points off the person in the middle of the of the programme, which happened in the last show, um, it was that was quite a desperate moment. <laughs> it's a shame because he's so talented and he was so good at it, but mm. his position was literally untenable, wasn't it? He, he couldn't, couldn't carry on. No, and and then we all, you know, it, it, no, he couldn't. And as I say, when when Christine Hamilton starts getting the uh, pulling the moral high ground over you or sitting in the you know it's oh no it's it's just and you see then you get into a thing where like every you know what do you do then every guest comes on is going to mention it so uh if you what do you do do you edit their comments out in which case they say to the daily mail oh i said all this stuff about angus dayton on last week's show and it wasn't used so therefore they're very good at handing it out but they can't, you know and you're getting into all that sort of stuff and it's just a nightmare i mean the thing with a t-shirt is actually that was towards the end of one series there was then a sort of three month gap and it was only when the new series started that other stuff came out that's when it became a problem the t-shirt itself um, was you know saved him it was hysterical your comic timing was brilliant and it was probably the most funny moment ever on the show but it must have been uncomfortable afterwards or was he aware of it well he's thanked me for, 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 for for making it funny so mm. you know that was that was the only thing we could do. Well, in my view, you know, and there was talking about well, what, are we going to, you know, when are we going to mention it? I said you've got to mention it right at the top of the show. Mm. You know, you've got to, just got to go for it because nobody will be listening to anything until we do. Was there ever a point where you considered a permanent replacement for Angus? I think there may have been uh, amongst the people who make the show, but I, I don't think anyone really sort of. No one really sort of was well, certainly in the early days did it in such a way we'd go yes you're definitely the person to do it you could you could see the advantages of different people doing it and no one person was sort of like stamp their identity on it in such a way where you where you say well no, you, it must be you so I, I think now we've got a sort of we've got a, you know we've got a very uh, competent and able uh, group of people that can do it you know regularly each series now. What I love about it is the fact that it's the smartest of all of the quiz shows because every week the news changes, so it can go on forever. It's yes. a brilliant format, isn't it? Yes, I mean, it is. You know, if, if your raw material is the news, and of course, you, as you say, you've got this ever-changing landscape, uh, Lib Dems are elect- you know, in the business of electing a leader at the moment, and uh, uh, and there's always something happening. So, um, yes, it, there's no reason why it shouldn't uh, walk and walk <laughs> do you look forward to doing it you look like you enjoy it although your face doesn't always tell the same yes, story <laughs> yes. no I do I, I, I do look forward to it and it's great to be involved in a show that's still after all these years seen by a large number of people and uh, people are always complimentary about it so it, to be associated with something like that of course is, 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 is a dream isn't it in show business that's what you want it's something that uh, a lot of people that work you're proud of doing that a lot of people enjoy 
It's also interesting because it's highbrow, but it's still for everybody. Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, we always, I mean, right at the beginning, it was always my thought, and I think this was shared by the other people working on the show as well, that you, you, you have to play to an intelligent audience. You have to, you have to assume your audience is intelligent and give them stuff that will appeal to an intelligent audience, and then you get an intelligent audience. So we, 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 we tend to sort of, you know, not highbrow, but at least we don't dumb down. What's that Ian Hislop like then? <laughs> <laughs> he's uh, he's lovely and he's very good. I like him very much. Uh, and if you look at old copies of Private Eye from the, before he edited it um, back in the sixties and seventies, I got bought some at a junk shop the other day. It's absolutely an appalling magazine. <laughs> Homophobic, anti-feminist, anti-women. Never mind anti-feminism. It was just terrible, terrible. And uh, I've got great respect for Ian. I think he does. Uh, you know, he does a cracking job. It's also one of those programmes, it doesn't matter who wins, it's, it's almost irrelevant, isn't you it? You tell Ian that. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's, he's desperate to win every week. Desperate. You watch his face when he loses. <laughs> it's been really nice talking to you today, Paul. A fascinating life. And you're one of those people that just keeps doing the business week after week, month after month, year after year. And you're always current. How are you treated by the public? Can you walk the streets without being harangued by young ladies whipping their tops off? Um, uh, not in summer, no. Uh, <laughs> in winter, it's a different kettle of fish. <laughs> uh, no, people are just always friendly. They're always a smile, and they, you know, I haven't had anyone say anything nasty to me for for well for years. I tend to, the only thing I do, I avoid pubs. You know, avoid people when they're drunk because that's when it's difficult. Because they 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 might like you, but in their confusion, <laughs> they, <laughs> that turns into violent <laughs> hatred. <laughs> I get that all the time. Don't worry about it. The new book is out now. It's called Silent Comedy. It's a really great read and beautifully illustrated. Presumably all very proud of it yes i'm pleased with how it's turned out I mean, when I, if myself as a 14 year old boy would have loved this book <laughs> as a christmas present so and I, I it's i've written books before fictional work and this was much harder because with fiction you can just say anything you like in the end but with this you have to kind of sort of back up what you're saying but i think the key part of this book is talking to hopefully it brings the films to life and gives you some idea of the people behind them so they're not just still black and white shadows on a wall but you know they were once living and breathing do you have any ambitions now is there anything you want to achieve or are you just happy plodding along the way you are uh, as successful um, as you are yeah I, I would like the one thing but uh, I'd have to sort of drop everything else with you one thing to do is I'd like to direct a film again I directed a short film about six or seven years ago but to, but to work you know to work on, on a movie you have to be completely 100% dedicated to it and uh, at the moment I just haven't got the time so that may be the one thing I, re that I never do but uh, at the moment I've got a vague idea for a script which I've worked on before but you know, I just haven't got the time at the moment what about serious acting and things like that? Does that interest you or moving into any other form actors of show? Are fairly, actors, actors are fairly low down on the food chain, <laughs> you know, you know, in any production. So I wouldn't, I'd be, and actors are a funny bunch as well, you know. Not all of them, some of them are good, good but some of them are, some of them are moaning when they're not working and some of them are moaning when they are working. You know. <laughs> oh, do we have to come in at that time? And all this sort of business, and I, I, I wouldn't, I, it wouldn't suit me. It's not for you? No. And what about the, the ultimate chat show up against Paul O'Grady or something like that? Um... Well, I don't do Room 101 anymore, mainly because I can't pronounce it. Um, <laughs> I don't know. It's, again, you sort of, I mean, the, with, with that show, it was good to do because I always interviewed people I wanted to interview. And I think if you become a general sort of, I suppose you have to be interested in everybody. I, I don't know. I, I, I'll, I'll wait till the massive offers are made. <laughs> you did bring something new to Room 101, which I, I really liked as well. Your presentation style is so offensive, but funny and loving and warm at the same time. Mm. You've mastered that art of digging the knife in as deep as you can. Can, but doing it with a loving smile. I think that's so tremendous. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's nice to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Merton's new book, Silent Comedy, is in your stores now. The Thank smiling you so assassin. much. <laughs>